Section 11 of The Age of Elizabeth by Mandel Creighton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Book 3, Chapter 2, The Revolt of the Netherlands. The country which at the present day forms the two kingdoms of Holland and Belgium was called from its geographical position the Netherlands, or the Low Countries. It consists of a large plain formed round the mouths of the three great rivers, the Rhine, the Meuse, and the Scheldt. During the Middle Ages this land had belonged to many different lords, but was at last slowly united in the hands of the Valesian dukes of Burgundy, until by the marriage of Mary, daughter of Charles the Bold, to the Emperor Maximilian I, it passed under the rule of the House of Austria. Charles V inherited it as Maximilian's grandson. But still under Charles V, the Netherlands did not form one state for administrative purposes. Each of the seventeen provinces of which it was composed had its own constitution, its own assembly of estates, and some had their own stadtholder or local governor. For common purposes, general assemblies were held of the estates of all the provinces, but each province granted taxes separately and presented to the prince its own statement of grievances. Each province had its own charter and its own privileges to which it tenaciously clung. The principle of local government was strong in the Netherlands, and it would obviously be no easy task for Philip to reduce them to the position of a province of the Spanish monarchy. The towns were rich, and the burghers had a strong spirit of independence. The nobles were numerous and warlike, men accustomed to high positions of confidence, many of them impoverished and almost all ambitious. The question was whether Philip could manage to mold them to his will. In the early part of the sixteenth century the trade of the Netherlands had immensely increased. The Portuguese discoverers, by opening a direct communication by sea with India and southern Africa, had deprived Venice of the monopoly of trade with the East. Italy generally had been turned into the battlefield of Europe, and its commerce began to decay. Trade took up its abode more decidedly than before in the north of Europe. Antwerp became the great commercial capital of the world, and the Venetian ambassadors sighed to see Venice surpassed. Everywhere throughout the Netherlands, trade flourished and wealth abounded. The people lived in opulence and comfort. They were laborious, diligent, and ingenious. They had no delight in war, save as a means of securing lasting peace. They took no pleasure in martial exercises, but on their holidays their guilds of rhetoric delighted to represent some allegory, where they could set forth in visible form some moral truth or maxim of worldly wisdom, decked with all the glory of costume that art could devise and wealth supply. When Philip left the Netherlands in 1559, he appointed as regent his half-sister, Margaret, Duchess of Parma. To help her in the government was a state council composed mostly of native nobles, but this was checked by a privy council consisting of those whom Philip could trust, and even they soon found that the regent had received orders to do nothing which was disapproved of by Antony Perrineau, generally known as Cardinal Granvella. Granvella was the son of the chief minister of Charles V, and had himself served the emperor. He was now Bishop of Arras, and was supposed to be deep in Philip's confidence and entirely devoted to Philip's interest. He was an ecclesiastic, and as such was likely to use all his influence to suppress the growing movement toward the reformed doctrines which Charles V had in vain tried to keep down. The nobles soon found themselves neglected. William of Nassau, whose father had been one of Charles V's most faithful generals, and who had himself been a great favorite of the emperor, found that he was subordinate to Granvella. William is generally known by the title of Prince of Orange. He inherited this small principality from a cousin who married the heiress of Orange-Chalon, 
and died without children. Count Egmont, who had won for Philip the Battle of Saint-Quentin, and Count Horn, one of the chief commanders of the day, both found that Philip employed only Spaniards and passed them by. The burghers felt that they were in danger of falling under a foreign yoke. They refused, according to their old liberties, to admit any foreigner to hold any office in the provinces. Their jealousy was awakened by the presence of Spanish troops, which had been levied for war against France. Before Philip left, the estates demanded their withdrawal, as it was against their liberties to have foreign troops quartered within their borders. He promised angrily to withdraw them, but did his best to find excuses for keeping them there. The Zealanders threatened that if their land were longer polluted by foreign troops, they would open their dikes and let in the ocean, rather than endure their hated presence. The regent was obliged to write and urge their withdrawal, which was reluctantly acceded to by Philip at the end of 1560. When once popular suspicion was roused, everything tended to excite it more, and the ecclesiastical measures of the king soon created a ferment. The Netherlands had only three bishoprics, and Philip had applied to the Pope to increase the number. A papal bull was accordingly issued, making three archbishops and fifteen bishops. These were to be endowed out of monastic property, and in this way, the wealth of the younger members of the noble families would be diminished, while the king, who was to appoint to the bishoprics, would greatly strengthen his political power and also would have the means of putting down heresy more effectually. The nobles saw in this a means of increasing the power of the detested Granvella. If religious persecutions were admitted, he might attack them under pretext of heresy. The Inquisition, an institution with regular officials and courts for inquiring into cases of heresy had been established in the Netherlands by Charles V in 1522 and had soon committed great devastations. The persecutions carried on by the inquisitors, already sufficiently hateful to the people, had been increased in rigor by an edict of Charles V in 1550 and another of Philip in 1555. Granvella, accordingly, was unpopular amongst all classes. The nobles addressed remonstrances to the king asking for his removal, but with no effect. At last, several of the chief of them entered into a league of defense against him. He was attacked in caricatures and lampoons by the people. The nobles, to ridicule his pomp and display, adopted a livery of the plainest serge, embroidered only at the sleeve with a fool's cap, which might be taken also for a monk's cowl. This rude Flemish wit told among the people. Even the regent began to tire of her subordination to Granvella. Orange, Egmont, and Horn all withdrew from the state council, saying that they were mere shadows there, and Granvella was the sole reality. At last the king was obliged to give way. He wrote to Granvella in February 1564, saying that it would be well for him to leave the country for a few days to visit his mother, and Granvella never returned. The nobles were triumphant. Orange, Egmont, and Horn resumed their seats at the council, resolved to carry out their own plans, and secure a national government for the Netherlands. Meanwhile, however, the new bishops had been appointed and new ecclesiastical arrangements were being carried out. Religious persecutions were more rigorously conducted and popular discontent had increased. The Spanish troops and the Spanish minister had been got rid of, but it seemed that the Spanish influence would return through the church and that the authority of Philip would be established under cover of the maintenance of religion. Nobles and people alike bent their endeavors to procure a modification of the religious edicts. If they could be suspended, the new bishops would be politically harmless. Count Egmont was sent to Philip to represent the state of affairs, but Philip would not yield on this point. He received Egmont kindly and dismissed him with fair speeches, but he sent to the regent 
ordering the publication of the canons which had just been passed by the Council of Trent, and bidding the magistrates everywhere to help the inquisitors to put down heresy. The nobles were alarmed at this, the people were in a fury, it was suspected that an alliance had been made between France and Spain to crush the Protestants and establish the royal power more firmly in the dominions of both. A deep determination to resist the Inquisition spread among all classes in society, amongst patriotic Catholics, as much as amongst the threatened Protestants. This feeling, early in 1566, found its expression in what is known as the Compromise, which was a bond declaring the Inquisition to be iniquitous, contrary to all laws, human and divine. The signers bound themselves to extirpate and eradicate the thing in any form as the mother of all iniquity and disorder. The compromise was largely signed by the lesser nobles and the richer merchants. The merchants especially felt the presence of the disturbed state of things. It is reckoned that thirty thousand Flemish weavers had fled to England before the persecution. There they were readily welcomed by Elizabeth. She gave them settlements in Sandwich and Norwich, and every Fleming so settled was obliged by law to employ at least one English apprentice. The English learned better the arts of cloth-making, silk-making, and dyeing, and no longer exported their wool for manufacture to Flanders, Instead of Antwerp sending its wares to England, Norwich sent out vessels laden with English fabrics for sale in the marts of Flanders. The Netherlands began to feel acutely the result of Philip's policy of intolerance. The signers of the Compromise next drew up a petition to the regent, setting forth that the Inquisition was likely to lead to rebellion and begging her to suspend it until the king's pleasure could be more fully known. It was presented with great ceremony by a body of some two hundred nobles on April 5, 1566. The Duchess dismissed them without an answer. She was much agitated, and one of her counsellors, Bellemont, exclaimed to cheer her, What, madam, is it possible your highness can fear these beggars? Gue? The saying spread, and the confederates in bravado adopted the badge of a beggar's wallet and called themselves the beggars, les gueux. The excitement spread amongst the common people, who flocked in crowds to hear the Protestant preachers. In the Netherlands, as elsewhere, Protestantism had assumed a strong political significance, but in the Netherlands it did so almost at once, for it was associated most directly with opposition to the foreign oppressor. This popular excitement could not last long without finding some very definite expression. On August 18th was the ceremony of the Omehang, or procession of a miraculous image of the Virgin at Antwerp. As the priests swept through the streets, they were greeted by the jeers of the crowd. Meiken, Meiken, little Mary, they exclaimed, your hour is come. For the next two days there were riots in the cathedral. At last the crowd was roused to fury. The image was torn in pieces, and all the images and statues that adorned the building were pulled down. The example was followed in other churches and soon spread to other towns. A wave of iconoclasm passed over the land, and the noble ecclesiastical buildings of many cities in the Netherlands were robbed of their richest ornaments. The Duchess was alarmed and was on the point of flight. She was stayed, however, by her council, and on August 25th published an accord which abolished the Inquisition and allowed liberty of preaching the new doctrines in places where it had already been practiced. Philip, however, was not likely to be content with this. He waited first for the natural reaction to follow on the iconoclastic riots. All moderate men had been shocked by them. All fervent Catholics had been dismayed by this turn of affairs. The leading nobles had been willing enough to use Protestant religious feeling as a political weapon against Philip, but they were not prepared to establish Protestantism. They were willing enough to bring pressure to bear upon the king, but they felt that they could not be concerned in riots, and they were not prepared for violent measures against Philip. Egmont withdrew from his former opposition, 
and resolved henceforward to serve philip horne retired to his own house determined to interfere no more in political matters the confederate nobles now somewhat weary of noisy demonstration professed themselves satisfied with the accord and dissolved their bond the result of this naturally was that the hands of the government were strengthened and the party of opposition was hopelessly divided it was not long before the regent took advantage of this state of feeling the disturbances were everywhere checked the city of valenciennes which had refused to admit a garrison was besieged and at last taken by egmont who punished the citizens with ruthless severity he was determined to prove his loyalty to philip and show him that he had no sympathy with rebellion the fate of valenciennes was decisive for the time the protestants either hastened to make their submission or left the country a new and most stringent oath of allegiance requiring a promise of unqualified obedience to the government was imposed on all who held office under the crown it was taken by all nobles except only the prince of orange who refused to admit this innovation upon the old constitution he resigned all his offices and withdrew from the netherlands into germany to see what course events were likely to take there were in philip the second's privy council two men whose opinion most weighed with him the duke of alva and don rui gomez de silva prince of eboli they were two widely different men rui gomez had gained the royal favour by his suppleness and address he thoroughly knew his master's character and fell in unobtrusively with his master's ways philip was helped in the process of thinking which he found a slow one by the forethought and considerateness of his careful minister who seemed to anticipate his thoughts yet with due deference alva on the other hand was a noble of the old spanish type haughty proud self-asserting who felt that his position was only the due reward of his merits he was devoted to the king for only in the king's service could he honourably obtain glory between these two ministers a bitter opposition raged philip encouraged each of them in turn and listened to the complaints of the one against the other for he thought that in this way he would get to their true opinions and so would gain the greatest amount of good out of both about the policy to be pursued toward the netherlands these two ministers as usual differed rui gomez as being no soldier was in favour of pacific measures alva as one of the chief captains of the age advocated severe repression he undertook if he were only supplied with spanish troops to reduce the netherlands to subjection once for all and secure that the netherlands taxes should flow regularly into philip's coffers the wealth of the heretics was to pay for the war and enrich the king as well philip's finances could ill endure the losses that came from the disturbed state of the netherlands he agreed with alva's policy and sent him with an army of ten thousand veterans the picked troops of italy and spain to reduce the provinces to submission alva set out in may fifteen sixty seven resolved to do his work thoroughly his own political credit was at stake here was a splendid opportunity of doing the greatest possible service to the king of vindicating his own foresight and of returning triumphant over his rival he went to the netherlands with full powers and the duchess of parma finding herself superseded resigned her office and retired alva occupied the towns with his troops determined to strike terror at once he arrested counts egmont and horn and committed them to prison he next established a council for the trial of offences committed during the recent disturbances from its severity this council has won for itself the title of the blood council and the number of its victims spread terror throughout the land counts egmont and horn were indicted on the charge of having stirred up a plot against the king they were found guilty and condemned to death neither their high position their noble birth nor their former services could save them from philip's wrath they were beheaded on june fifth fifteen sixty eight in the great square at brussels alva had cowed the netherlands into submission 
but there was still one man who talked of resistance, one whom Alva's power could not reach. The Prince of Orange, condemned by the Blood Council with Egmont and Horn, published from his retirement in Germany a justification which was an indignant attack upon Philip's tyranny. A change had come over the character of Orange. Up to this time he had been an adherent of the old church, but his opinions slowly changed in exile. He became a determined Protestant of the school of Calvin, yet with views of wider toleration than were common in his day. He now, in Philip's name, enlisted soldiers against Alva, and granted a commission to his brother, Count Louis of Nassau, setting forth that to show his love to the king and to the provinces, and to maintain the privileges sworn by the king, he empowered his brother to enroll troops. At first Count Louis obtained some advantage in Friesland, and hoped for assistance from the Huguenots in France but Alva took the field against him, and at Yemingen the raw recruits of Count Louis fled at once before the veterans of Spain, July 22, 1568. For two days the fugitives were slaughtered. Count Louis succeeded in making his escape, but few of his soldiers were so fortunate. Seven Spaniards only were killed, and seven thousand rebels. It seemed too clear that it was hopeless for the unhappy Netherlanders to think of resistance, but Orange was not daunted. In September he entered Brabant and challenged Alva, who refused a battle, but inflicted severe damage on the army of Orange, who after a month's campaign was obliged to retire without having effected anything. Again Alva was triumphant. The Netherlands lay at his feet. His severities were redoubled and in the citadel of Antwerp he erected a colossal statue to himself, for having extinguished sedition, chastened rebellion, restored religion, secured justice, and established peace. End of section 11